Hi there. So today I thought I'd talk about what's gone wrong within the education system and what we can do to try to fix it. So um, first thing to do is just to explain um, for those that don't know what my background is. So I, I taught A-level economics in England um, for 35 years. Uh, actually, it wasn't 35 years. It was 33 years because I also spent two years uh, working in Finland teaching the IB. So I was basically teaching um, 16 to 19 year olds. And I taught in both the private sector where you have to pay fees. So selection via um, whether you can afford to go or not pay the fees and then just regular state education, six form colleges actually in the main. So the, the first thing that I want to point out to many, many people that they get wrong is uh, especially Brits is that they think that if they cough up the dough to send their kid to a private school in England they'll avoid all the woke stuff and I want to just say to you that you're living in cloud cuckoo land if you think that that's the case because in my experience private schools are just as woke as state schools and the reason for that is that the private schools also have to abide by state regulations. So they're given targets, they're told um, what, what courses that they must teach. So there's very little freedom that private schools have over state schools. And I'd actually say that um, the state school that my son went to actually was less woke than the, pri the posh private school that, that I last taught him. So I think this is something that's quite interesting is that I believe that like ownership, it, 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 it doesn't really matter as much as it should matter anymore. Like you might own something privately, theoretically, but if the government is telling you what you must do with your asset, what you must, what, what must go on in your so-called private school, what you must uh, teach young people, then is it really private at all? You know, if you're still dancing to the government's tune, yes, I know theoretically you might own it, but is it really yours? Do you really have any um, ownership of it in a, in, a, in a truer sense? And this was basically what happened in National Socialist Germany in the 1930s, was that there was still quite a lot of private ownership, but it was still a technocracy in that the state um, gave out orders to those privately owned companies and they had to do whatever the state told them to do or, or else. So second thing is um, that I want to tell you about is, is that we fundamentally misunderstand intelligence. This is what I can tell you as, as a former teacher. What we tend to think is intelligence, which is like, you know, can somebody remember a good memory? Um, are you a fast and accurate repeater station? Are you prepared to like memorize stuff and then, then puke it out all over an exam paper? Uh, the system really rewards those types of people, people who've got fast and accurate memories. And these people aren't truly intelligent at all. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, take Boris Johnson. One of his specialities is that he memorizes uh, long sections of, of uh, prose from like Homer, you know, one of the Greek classics. And um, it, he'll recite it. And he thinks that we should be impressed by his ability to just rote learn and puke out a, a, a load of words. Um, James Dellingpole is another one. Um, he'll, he'll memorize Psalms and he'll think he's terribly clever for him being able to to memorize those and just repeat them um, to, to order. So the, the, the problem is, is that um, these, these people, these well-qualified people who are just repeater stations, people with fast and accurate memories, um, they've ended up in quite important positions of power. Obviously, you know, the medical profession is full of these repeater station type people. And, um, you know, you can see it at the top of organisations, maybe like, I don't know, randomly British Airways. And this is why things aren't working anymore. We've got too many, we've got too many idiots at the top of organisations, well-qualified idiots, but idiots nevertheless. 
Um, real intelligence is about the ability, the willingness and ability to think independently and, and um, critically and to have uh, the capacity for original thought, you know, to see connections between vari uh, variables, to establish logical sequences of, of, co of um, causation, of cause and effect. That's what real intelligence is. Also, you know, um, I believe that intelligent people ask questions, whereas what we've got, I think, in, in let's summarise it, you know, amongst the British middle class is that we've got too many people who've got to where they've got to precisely because they don't rock the boat and they don't ask questions. All they do is just blindly obey. And this is what's gone in the, on in the law, in the police, in the NHS, in, in education in the main, um, is that the system's been rewarding conformity. You know, certainly in the, the last school that I worked at, you know, the, the kids kind of worked out that if they were to get on at school, they had to hug whatever the prevailing consensus was and hug it really closely. So if it was Black Lives Matter, listen very carefully to the narrative and then just say that you also believe in that too. Um, obviously, it would be the same with Divot 91. So don't rock the boat. Uh, sorry, don't rock the boat, rather. They do do debate in these places, but the debate takes place within a very, very narrow, like Overton window of acceptability. And anyone that comes up with ideas that are outside of the Overton window, they're quickly shut down. And they're deemed um, to be bad people. Of course, you know, they'll, they, their views might be labelled far right, fascist, etc. So students, they're like uh, Pavlov's dogs. They quickly suss out that um, people that are successful at school, they, they, they just parrot whatever the prevailing consensus is and they don't have ideas of their own. Which is obviously bad. You know, what we actually need is people who are critics of the existing paradigm. You know, that's what I would call a critical thinker. A critical thinker is somebody who's willing, prepared and able to offer a critique of the, of the current paradigm, the current thing. Yeah, so as I say, I think schools, what they do is that they ostracise students and teachers who, who enjoy thinking critically, who uh, enjoy uh, being able to come up with ideas of their own. And as I say, they absolutely hate anybody that asks anything uh, else but softball questions. Um, the other thing is that the exam system also rewards conformity too. So this, I used to teach A-level economics and on the macro side of the course, which is like the study of the economy and aggregation, um, you know, like what causes unemployment, inflation, why do some countries grow faster than others? That's what macroeconomics is. It was exclusively Keynesian economics, the sort of big government model of, of economics. There was no Austrian school uh, economics in the A-level syllabus. So I remember going along to a meeting where, where the teachers met the chief examiner. I remember collaring this guy or it was a woman actually, and saying to her, like this, you, you're actually introducing a horrible amount of bias in, into, into the education system here because um, students aren't being told both, both sides of the story. They're only being told about Keynesianism. And um, this is just immoral. It's, un, it's unethical. And students wouldn't even know because they weren't even exposed to these other arguments. And I think obviously this has gone on within the um, the health system as well, that, that doctors have only been taught about a particular approach to health and any other approach. Uh, well, if people talk about that, then they lose their jobs, they get censored. So this is not the way uh, to go about ascertaining the truth. This is not the way to go if you want to develop human knowledge. This is not the way to go if you want to see uh, advances in the quality of life. This is the kind of emperor's new clothes model, isn't it? Or the the, the Brezhnev years in the, in the Soviet Union where everything just stagnated because any ideas that came outside the existing paradigm were just slammed 
and the people articulating those ideas were thrown into gulags for, for wrong think. And that's where we are now in, in, well, certainly in Britain and most of Western Europe. So, um, you know, an example of it was, um, I remember an, another time um, there was a, an exam paper question about, uh, that's the students to define what inflation was. And on the mark scheme, it just said in, um, inflation is the annual percentage increase in, in the average price level, something like that. So it's bog standard Keynesianism. So just as a matter of interest, I actually sort of contacted the chief examiner and said, well, look, what about the Austrian school? They would say that inflation is the annual percentage increase in the money supply. If a student wrote that, would that be deemed to be wrong? And this woman said, yeah, it would. And I said, well, that's what you're doing here is that you're passing off your subjective opinions on economics as, as objective facts. So what I recommend that you do is, is actually rename your, your A-level macroeconomics course and actually call it what it is, um, A-level Keynesian macroeconomics, because, um, you know, your label is, is, um, is misinformation. Um, you, you're misleading people. And also what I saw over my time in, in teaching was that teachers like me uh, found it increasingly hard to teach students in a way that was stimulating. So um, there was two main mechanisms for that. The, the first mechanism was um, teaching methods. So teachers that were knowledgeable about their subjects, uh, teachers that could stand up at the front, talk, ask questions, get some sort of a debate going, a whole class debate, that was deemed as being didactic and not very good. Um, and instead what they wanted was um, like self-discovery, student-centered learning. And I remember going to watch one of these lessons that was being held up as an example of good teaching in another school. And um, that, the lesson that I saw was it was trying to explain this concept called price elasticity of supply in, in economics. And it's quite a technical concept. And all that the teacher did was that um, she sat at the front of the class and told the students, um, find out, switch on the computers. They all had a computer each. Um, find out what price elasticity of supply is on the Internet and make notes of your own. And that was it. And that was deemed to be good teaching. And she just sat at the front and, uh, I don't know, did a bit of uh, internet shopping or, or whatever. And I, quite frankly, I was horrified. And the thing that I want to say here is that the type, of, the type of student that can learn from that is the hardworking, uh, ambitious, um, self-motivated, but slightly dim student, the repeater station, who um, would be quite happy to um, make notes of their own, go away, rote learn it, and then puke it out in the exam. Whereas the truly kind of intelligent, sparky students, they just can't, like I would, I would say that I would include myself in that when I was at school, is that I just couldn't cope with stuff like that. I would just find it so boring. I'd want to interact with a human being, not, not interacting with a human. So I think a lot of our, our bright students over the last 10 or 15 years have actually been switched off by the education system. And um, often they don't get the qualifications that, that match their true intelligence. Whereas the Dumbos, the hardworking, conscientious types, the, the people with just fast and accurate memories, they end up in positions of, of uh, power um, that they're just not... They're not, not suited to. They're not able to think laterally, critically. All they are is just dumb repeater stations. So that's obviously very, very dangerous. I don't think that they've been able to pull off Divic 91 back in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, um, because there would have been too many well-educated people who were still able to think critically. So I, I think, you know, why did Divic 91 happen? I think a lot of it, it was just a failure of the education system that's that's been selecting for people who've got fast and accurate memories rather than truly intelligent people who've got ideas of their own. They're capable of constructing 
logical sequences of cause and effect. They're able to spot patterns in data. These types of people, um, they've just been switched off by the modern education system. So we've just not been using our talent and we've just got uh, dumb consensus huggers who've sold us all down the river for their um, uh, ego and status symbols and their, their, their material creature comforts. So, yeah, that's... Oh, and the other thing, what was the other thing that I was going to say? There was, a, there was another... Uh, oh, yeah, the other one as well now is that teachers aren't allowed to... Like, my personal feeling as a teacher was that sometimes it was good to make students feel uncomfortable in the classroom. Now, there'll be some people on here who'll go, oh, that's not good. But it, making somebody feel uncomfortable might mean challenging their views, putting them on the spot, forcing the cogs inside their brain to go round, forcing them to think. So, and also, of um, you know, approaching controversial topics so just before I left, I remember using a, um, a past paper question. It was about, um, it was about uh, a medical issue in the, in, the, in the November Hotel Sierra. And um, somebody took offence because one of their parents had had this disease that was kind of the focus of this economics question. You know, how should we decide how many resources to put into treating this illness versus that illness? It's like an economic issue. Anyway, I was told off for that. Oh, you should have known that her one of her parents had blah, 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 because it was insensitive. So, you know, in this type of environment, it's actually very difficult to teach anything that's interesting because something that's interesting, well, somebody could take offence to that. So... What happens is that people just go for uh, things that are ultra safe and therefore ultra bland and therefore ultra boring. So that's all I want to say today. So um, God bless.